We're going to worship together.
something solid, something liquid. Um, that's all that's needed to partake in communion. If you are here with us today, go ahead and raise your hand if you were not, if you did not receive a communion cup on your way in. Um, and our ushers are in the back and they will come around um, to make sure that you get a communion cup. Uh, so God laid it on my heart this morning um, as I was praying and uh, spending time with uh, the Lord, I, I realized that while um, we come to the table and uh, Judas was there, and if you've, if you've read um, scripture, then you know that Judas was the one that betrayed uh, Jesus in the end. And it's so significant that Judas was there because he ate too, and all of us here um, are sinners and we've all struggled with shame we've all struggled with guilt and Judas n was going to go and betray Jesus and Jesus knew it um, and still he he fulfilled his commitment he went to the cross for each and every one of us he went there for Judas and so as we partake in communion this morning, as we come together as one body and we celebrate what it is that Jesus actually did for us, he sacrificed himself to give us life. So we come to the foot of the cross and we lay down that guilt, we lay down that shame, we lay down what it is that holds us back from taking a step forward for Jesus to what he's called us to. So this morning, if you'll take out your communion cup and um, you're going to, you're going to actually, there's two layers. The first layer is the piece of uh, bread, the, the wafer. So you're going to tear that back. And so as Jesus and his disciples uh, sat around the table, he broke the bread and he broke it into pieces and he, and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this 
is my body. Take it in remembrance of me. And Jesus poured the glass of wine and he, he said, this is the new covenant, that which I bled on the cross, the sacrifice. Take this in remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, I thank you. We come before you as one body, a body of so many different individuals, different races, different social class, different generations, God, but we come before you as one. We share one body. God, the bread was broken and we share that together. God, because you've called us all according to purpose. And God, as we, as we stand before your throne, as we sit here and worship you this morning, God, I just pray for each and every believer here in this, this room, those who might be far from you, God, those who don't yet know you. God, I just ask for your presence to be known. I ask for your spirit to flood their souls. God, you went to the cross and sacrificed yourself for us, though we are sinners. And God, so we lay down every part of us that holds us back from you. We lay it down at the foot of the cross. And we just ask that you, you fill us with your love, your peace, your comfort, your beauty, God. And you make us whole again. God, we come before you and we continue to worship you today and always as one body in Christ. God, we love you. We praise you. It is in your mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Did 
was praise and all I did was worship worship and all I did was bow down and all I did was stay noticed we had in the corner um, a, you can text need him for prayer and this is something we've been doing a couple weeks now but what it is is you text in your prayer during worship and you can text that number honestly anytime and what what it is is we get those and then we pray for a couple of them here up here and um, they're anonymous so we won't use names but all of the prayer requests we will be praying for throughout the week so please take advantage of that because we all need prayer right um, so this morning I have a couple prayer requests, so if you'll, get, if you'll join me, we're going to pray over these. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your grace and mercy. God, that we just get to gather here together, gather in this room, in this house, and worship you alone. God, we're so grateful for each and every individual who, who whether they're joining us here in person or if they're joining us online, God, we're so grateful um, that you've just provided the technology and uh, the space and, and God, that you're protecting us and uh, you're carrying us through. God, we um, come before you and we, we lift up these prayer requests. Um, God, for those fighting for, with addiction, God, whatever that might be, God, you know, <laughs> and, and God, you're a healer. God, we know uh, your word tells us that, God, you are in control. And God, we just, we ask that you would take whatever addiction is being fought this morning, that you would take that, that you would bind it up and, and remove it. God, that you would, you would fill that space where the addiction once stood. 
God, that you would fill that with your presence, that your, your spirit would come in and overwhelm, that it would just, it would bring a sense of peace. God, what the addiction has done, God, just take that and remove it from each of us. God, we all, we all struggle with addiction of some sort, whether it's caffeine, whether it's, it's drugs, pornography, alcohol. God, we ask that today, in the name of Jesus, that addiction would no longer control us, but God, that your spirit would be all that we need, all, all that we strive for. God, we lift up every relationship this morning. God, whether it's, it's friendship, whether it's marriage, whether it's family, God, we lift that up to you. And we ask for restoration in the broken relationships. God, we ask that relationships would be built on trust and they would be centered on you, Jesus. God, center us all on you. Center our hearts on you so that we can, one, work on ourselves. But God, that we can build strong relationships around us. God, that we would strive to be in life groups, that we would strive to do community, whether it's accountability groups, Whatever that may look like, God, I just pray that each individual in here has a healthy group around them so that they can build those relationships, so that they can, they can be who you've called them to be. God, and for those online, I pray that their relationships, that they are, um, whether they're, they're stuck at home or, or, or maybe today is just the, the one time that they haven't come out in person, God, or whatever that may look like. I pray for restoration in each of these relationships, God, that they would find healing, that they would find peace, and that they would find you, God, that they would find themselves centered on you and you alone. God, we come before you today, and we worship only you. We love you. We praise you. It is in your mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, Pastor Ricky actually has a few announcements, so if you'll turn to the screens, Pastor Ricky's over there. What's going on, everybody? Hey, that was really fast. Thank you so much for joining us today at Grace Fellowship Church. It is such an honor to have you guys with us. Uh, a special welcome to all of our first-time guests. Thank you for choosing to be with us this Sunday here at Grace Fellowship Church. It is so awesome to have you with us. Hey, if you are a first time guest, we would love to know that you joined us today and you can make that happen by filling out a connect card. Um, whether you are online or, or, or in person, we have an opportunity for you to fill out a connect card today. There's a section on each connect card that is specifically for our first time guests. So what happens is you fill that out and one, you let us know that you were here. That helps us know that you were here this Sunday, gives us an opportunity to engage with you, to connect with you, to welcome you and celebrate that you were here today. Maybe take some next steps with you, you know, get you plugged in, moving along, no pressure. Uh, but not only do you let us know that you were here, but the other awesome thing that happens is you help make a difference. So for every first time guest card that is turned in, the church will donate on your behalf to an organization called Tender Mercies. And what they do is feed families in need. Uh, so for every first time guest card that is turned in, two different families of four are fed. So again, you're letting us know that you're here and you're also making a huge difference in so many lives in the community. So thank you again for joining us and thank you for helping be a light and make a difference. We are so, so thankful and so excited to have you with us. Uh, just a reminder to everybody else, that Connect card is not just for our first time guests. So make sure that you take a look at it. You, yes, you take a look at that card. Weird. Um, take a look at it. If there's any step you feel led to, to, or anything you feel led to fill out to take a next step, maybe it's prayer requests, serving, getting plugged into a life group, whatever that may be, there's something on there for you. Take a look. If you feel led to fill it out, fill it out and turn that in today. Thanks for doing that, guys. You're the best. Hey, just a reminder of a few ways that we can do tithes or offering here at Grace Fellowship Church. If you are in person, we have our offering boxes that line the back wall of the sanctuary. Back walls, not just one, multiple. Um, and these are black boxes on the back walls with white envelopes next to each box for check and cash giving. So you can take care of that today in person. Uh, or you can do it online at our website, gracelotten.org. Or you can text to give by texting the number 84321. Whatever works best for you, 
Thank you so much for taking care of that today. Hey, some other things said hey again that are happening here at Grace Fellowship Church. One, it is the last week for the book sale for third option happening in the foyer today, last week. Books being sold at cost. This series has been amazing. It's been so cool to watch what God is doing in our church, in our community, uh, in so many people's lives and relationships. So if you want to follow on along, you want to dig deeper uh, into this idea of the third option, make sure that you go grab a book today. It's an amazing book. It's been an amazing series. So make sure you go get one. It's the last week. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. It's great. One more thing. Hey, we have something else happening in the foyer. I keep saying hey, but it's okay. We have something else happening in the foyer today. You're gonna to see this whole display at the top of the wall, at the top of the stairs. It is our Build the House event. So what this is, is an opportunity for anybody who's been interested or maybe God has laid it on your heart to get plugged in here at Grace Fellowship Church, call this church home and start serving here. Maybe you wanna jump into a ministry. GSM, students, come on. Grace Kids, First Impressions, whatever that is, worship and media, the worship collective. Come on, all great things here at Grace Fellowship Church. Um, but if you're interested in getting plugged in, interested in serving, this is an opportunity for you to get some more info on what that looks like. So go out to this whole setup, take a look at all the other, all of the ministries, um, whatever it is that God has laid your heart to sign up for, sign up for that, get some more info from us, info, not info, info from us, uh, and also get a donut, okay? There's Hertz Donuts out there, so at least go out there to get a donut. I'll be out there just for a donut. It's going to be great, or two. Get some donuts, Hertz Donuts. They're amazing and delicious, magically. That's I'm gonna get copyrighted. Anyways, it's gonna be great. Get out there, have some fun, sign up for uh, a ministry. We love you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have an amazing day. Now it's time to jump into our fourth and final week of the third option with Pastor Josh. Let's go. Woo! Yeah. Good morning, guys. Uh, and good morning to you guys streaming online. And uh, we love you, and we're so glad that you're here today. How many of you agree with me that it looks like Pastor Ricky may have eaten about a pound of sugar before that video was recorded? Um, maybe just a lot of donuts. I'm not exactly sure what was going on. Let's pray and invite Jesus Christ into this morning's message. Lord, Lord, mm. God, thank you for worship. Thank you for communion. Lord, thank you for the way that all these things have taken our focus and trained it on you. Um, Jesus, we confess that as we've gone throughout this week, we've been pulled in so many directions. We've heard so many voices speaking into our lives. It is good. It feels like rest to just come and sit at the feet of Jesus right now. Um, Lord, we need you. We know that we need you. Um, we thank you for the way that you bring us back to center Jesus, I pray you would do that right now. Uh, this is this final week in the third option and talking about this important topic. God, would you just come in right now, Lord? Lord, would you come in right now? And Lord, would you, would you direct, Lord? Would you shape my words, God? Would you shape our hearts to hear you? Lord, would you, God, would you just, would you bring power, Lord, to this time that we have together? Lord, we want to be touched by God. That's what we want. We didn't come to church to check a box today, Lord. We, we, we came to meet with you, Lord. Even, even for the folks that are online, God, watching through a TV screen, none of that matters to you, Lord. You made heaven and earth, God. You can absolutely reach out to us through a screen. So Jesus, would you do it right now, God? All of us ask you together in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Are you guys with me today? Oh, yeah. Can I have some mask? amens today. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. It takes a bit more, and I appreciate the, the love of God's people with just bringing some energy. It is always more fun when the energy is here. Um, let me start us off. Yes, let me start us off with a story. Um, have you ever seen a Harry Potter movie? Okay, and I know that's controversial in the church. It's okay. We'll get over it. Um, there's a lot of Harry Potter movies out there, right? And, and when you start with the very first few, there's three main characters that, that get a lot of the screen time. And it's Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And Harry is the guy that he's kind of the hero. And he's super brave and super active and, and, and all this stuff. Everybody loves Harry. And then there's Hermione and she's the brainiac, right? She knows everything. She's, and she's got the know-it-all personality, right? Uh, so that's Hermione. And then you get Ron, and he's kind of the third wheel. 
he's just kind of the extra. And he's kind of tall and gangly. He's clumsy. He doesn't do a lot of right things. He's not super smart. People have pretty low expectations of Ron. He's not very brave. They just kind of don't expect him to do much, but he's good for a laugh. And then you keep going throughout these movies, and they all start to mature and change. And there starts to come moments where Ron has grown up a little bit, and he'll suddenly do things that are good. He'll, he'll do something smart, or he'll do something brave. And when he does something right, the other two are always like shocked that Ron did something good. And it, it gets to become a joke later on in the movies where Ron will look to them and say, why the tone of surprise? Every time I do something good, why the tone of surprise at me? And, and what he's saying there is, and as much, of it, as much as it's a joke, what he's saying there is, could you let go of the low expectations you always have on me? Right? There's something beyond the laugh that's a little bit more serious. Have you ever experienced that? Could you please get beyond the low expectations that you have of me? So we had a racial conversation a few months ago here at this church. It was on a Friday night. We've talked about it before. We brought a lot of black families and some white families together. And we had a discussion for a few hours. And we just started talking about stuff. And people were sharing their stories. And one story was shared by a woman, a black woman that goes here to Grace. And she's a business owner. And very, very sharp. Very, very successful in her business. And so she was at this meeting this one particular night. And she's speaking up front in front of all these business owners. And she does a great job. Very, very inspiring. And after this meeting gets over, somebody comes up to our sister and, and tries to encourage her. And in the midst of trying to encourage her on her speaking ability, one of the phrases that they use is, you are a credit to your people. Now that bothered some of you instantly. Others of us were like, what was the problem? Why the tone of surprise? Do you operate with a low expectation of my people? And now you're surprised? That doesn't feel good, does it? Doesn't feel good. It wouldn't feel good to any of us. Um, it's a nuance. Can we agree that it's a nuance this morning? It's, it, it can be subtle. For some of us, it doesn't feel very subtle at all. We have to dive into the subtleties. We have to dive in to the nuances. And some of that is going to be for us today is to dive in to all of that. This is week four in a third option. This is our final day in the third option talking about this topic. Next week, we start a brand new series called Good News because 2020 has been all bad news. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to do a series completely devoted to good news starting next week. And I'm very excited to get onto that series. But today is the final message in the third option. And one of the things that we've been talking about, just a little bit of review before we go any further, is we've been talking about those subtleties. We've been talking about racism versus bias. And those are two really different words. Amen? So racism, what we've been discussing is you got to define these words and you got to use them correctly, especially at this church. You need to use these words correctly. Racism, here's what it means. Racism means that I have, an, I have a belief system. I have a philosophy that says one race, usually it's my race, is superior to all the other races. And because that belief system exists in me of racism, I will say things and I will do things that come out of that foundation. Amen? Bias is different. Bias may not be that I actually believe one race is superior, but I may have grown up a particular way. I was taught to talk a certain way. Maybe I was taught to go and tell people you're a credit to your people. And that was just wrong to say that. But it's a blind spot for me, and I need to be corrected on that. I need to find those blind spots, and like a good Christ follower, I need to say, it's okay to admit that I'm wrong. As long as I can find things about me that need to change so that I can be less me and more like Jesus, then that's a good thing, amen? amen. 
And so let's find those biases together. But I don't have to accuse you of being a racist just because you've got some biases to work on or I've got some biases to work on. They can be subtle. And in the midst of that subtlety, one of the big things is that we need to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And not only do we need to hear him, but his voice in our lives needs to be the loudest voice. Say loudest he, it needs to be the loudest voice in our lives. The voice of the Holy Spirit in your life needs to be louder than CNN. It needs to be louder than Fox News. It needs to be the most compelling voice in your life is the voice of God. And whenever the voice of CNN or Fox News conflicts with the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit. It must hold more sway. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. There's only one who is true. And every man a liar. Let's review a few more things. We've been talking about racism in this series. And racism is worth talking about. One of the, one of the issues that I was wrestling with before we started this series is why talk about racism? Why is this an issue from the, for the church? And week one, we talked about that. Week one, we talked about the idea that in heaven, and it's described to us in uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, John actually sees the people of God around the throne of God worshiping him. And when he sees them, when he sees this final church in heaven, where we're all headed, where we're all going to be, John sees a multi-ethnic congregation. He sees people from every race and nation and tongue, and they're all clothed in white robes, signifying the purity and, and, and the, the fact that they are cleansed from their sins. But they're multi-ethnic. So we describe the fact that heaven is a multiracial church. Heaven is a multiracial family. And if heaven is a multiracial family, why are we so segregated on Sunday mornings here on planet Earth? And so don't we want to get to that as soon as humanly possible? So let's talk about this issue, is what we said. And then the week after that, we talked about Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came a-tumbling down, right? And Joshua, the night before the Battle of Jericho, he went and he had this meeting with an angel who turned out to be the angel of the Lord, which is a pre-incarnate Christ for you theog theological geeks like me out there. Pre-incarnate Christ, right? And he meets with him, and he says, hey, angel of the Lord, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the angel says, neither. Neither or neither, depending on where you're from. <laughs> option one, option two, third option. Jesus, are you for Fox or for CNN? Neither. neither. Are you for whites or for blacks? Neither. neither. Are you for Coke or for Pepsi? Oh. Dr. Pepper. <laughs> it's Dr. Pepper is the right answer. <laughs> right? It's the third option for sure. <laughs> the point is loyalty. The third option is all about loyalty. This series is all about loyalty. We give our loyalty to so many different groups, groups that are like us, groups that make sense to us. The reason we watch this particular news channel is because it makes more sense to us, right? But they do not deserve our loyalty. Why? Because they didn't die for us. Fox and CNN, they didn't die for us. Uh, Obama and Trump, they didn't die for us. Only Jesus did. And he demands our loyalty. And there are so many moments in the life of the Christian where they have to decide on their ultimate loyalty and other loyalties. And ultimate loyalty is the whole thing. It must be to God alone. Then last week we talked about the Good Samaritan. And we dove into this whole idea that racism was actually in the Bible. Racism was actually a really big issue when Jesus walked the earth, that there were Jews and there were Samaritans and they were two different races, not only different religious groups, they were also two different races. And Jesus tried to cross racial lines and he told this parable, the good Samaritan. He actually made the Samaritan the hero of the story. But the really big point of it was that in order to cross racial lines, you gotta, you gotta care for somebody. You gotta give them your heart. You gotta actually 
reach out in a practical way in order to make somebody your neighbor. The people who aren't like you, they're not your neighbor today. They are those people. But when you choose to love them, you make them family. You make them your neighbor. And that's what Jesus called us to. So today, we're going to talk about Samaritans again. And this is John chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, turn to John chapter 4. Smartphone, go there. We're also going to have it on the screens. And if you're online, it's going to be across the bottom of the screen just for you. John chapter 4, verse 1. Let's dive in. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus didn't baptize them, his disciples did. Now, why is he even talking about that? It's simply because in verse 1 and verse 2, it's saying that Jesus was at a point in his ministry where he had become popular. He was baptizing a lot of people. And people were start, starting to compare him to other religious leaders. But in the midst of this popularity, he deals with an individual. Verse 3, so he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. And he had to go through Samaria on the way. Uh, geography lesson for you real quick. Judea is in the south of Israel. Galilee is in the north. And in between is Samaria. So when, when, when John says, the writer of this gospel says, that Jesus had to travel through Samaria, it is the most direct route. And in that case, it's true. But it's not true in a different sense. It's not true in the fact that he had to. He didn't have to. He could have gone around. And most Orthodox Jews in Jesus' day, they went around. They went around Samaria. Why? Because they didn't like them. They were those people. If, if you study the history, back in 722 B.C., there was a battle and the Assyrians had come and invaded Israel. And when they came and invaded Israel, they didn't just defeat them. They actually took the Jewish people and they exported them out to Assyria. It's like the Borg in Star Trek. They're going to assimilate them. All right? They make them Assyrians was the goal. Of course, God eventually brought his people back because God is good. Amen? And he eventually brought his people back. But in between time, while the exile was going on, the Assyrians left just a few Jews there. And there was just a few of God's people left behind and they intermarried with, intermarried with Gentile peoples and had babies. And they had different religious beliefs. And they worshiped God in a different place, not Jerusalem. You're going to see that in a minute. And they were considered mixed race. Some of you here today and some of you guys watching, you're mixed race today and you're not exactly sure where you belong. These folks were mixed race. They were called half-breeds by the Jews. They were called those Samaritan dogs. They didn't, even, they didn't even consider them people or humans made in the image of God. Those Samaritan animals is what they called them. But Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment. Let's read verse 5. Eventually, Jesus came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. And soon, verse 7, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. There's a whole sermon in those verses. Huge what's going on here. A lot of attention first on this well. It says Jacob multiple times. Talk, talks about this field that Jacob had had and given to his son. And there was this well that was there. Why does it talk so much about Jacob and his well? Here's why. Because the Samaritans considered Jacob one of their spiritual fathers and leaders, patriarchs. They admired Jacob. He was part of their shared history with the Jews. So Jesus comes to a place where he knew was common ground between Jews and Samaritans. Sometimes in our own racial conversations that, that God will call us to, one of the first things that we need to do is seek out common ground. The next detail I want you to notice is that Jesus wanted a drink out of her cup. Wanted a drink out of her cup. This is a big deal. 
He could have gone to her country. He could have met with this woman and had a conversation. But he wanted to drink out of her cup. That's physical. That's, that's, that's a willingness. I'm going to be part of your world here. I don't consider you ultimately, foundationally dirty or unclean. The cup that you brought with you today to draw water out of the well, I'll drink from your cup, Jesus says. And she's about to be shocked by this. But you need to see this. This is so, so important. Jesus does not preach to her about God first. He drinks from her cup first. He practically, physically crosses a racial boundary. And this is huge. Verse 8, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. I love the disciples are always hungry, amen? Amen. They always want some food. You heard about the donuts, right? There's a lot of donuts out there. And they went into the village to buy some food. I figured Taco Bell, if they were Ricky and Tander, they would have gone to Taco Bell. The woman was surprised at Jesus for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Again, see how low her standard is? They don't even have anything to do with us, let alone drink from our cup. Jesus, she said to Jesus, you are a Jew. Big surprise. And I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She knows he's a Jew. What, what is about to begin here and what we're going to analyze here in God's word is what I would call a race consultation. Sometimes we walk into a room and there's people who are not like us and our blood starts to pump just a little bit faster. We get a little bit nervous. We're not sure how it's going to go. It might be a little bit uncomfortable and we think it's going to be a race confrontation. Say confrontation. 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 Jesus is about to turn a potential confrontation into a consultation. A consultation is where we learn. You, what you need more of in your life is some race consultations where you walk in as a teachable person, ready to get to know an individual who is in your out group, just like Jesus does here. Here's a question. How does she know he's a Jew? She says, you're a Jew. How does she know? The way he's dressed, the way he talks, Everything about him is a proud Jewish man. Why is that important? Because you need to know that the Messiah and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was born into an ethnicity. And when he was born into that ethnicity, he operated within that group. And he did not try to deny that. He did not try to cleanse it out of himself in any way. Even as he tried to reach across racial lines, he kept his own ethnicity intact. So as you reach out to other people who are not like you, do not begin to feel like I've got to talk a different way. I've got to dress a certain way. I've got to somehow cleanse my own ethnicity out in order to reach across to this person. No, that is not what Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 shows us about the multi-ethnic church of Jesus Christ. Proud Jewish man. And I love that he drinks from her cup first. Do you remember in the history of the United States, there were times and there were places in the United States where black people could not go where white people were, where black people could not touch or drink from or eat from places where white people were that there was a hatred, there was a belief system that ran so deep. And Jesus reverses that here. And Jesus says, you're made in the image of God and I will set my Jewish lips to your cup. That's powerful. And it's physical and it matters. There's a social reach before a theological reach. Verse 10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift that God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Jesus is starting to introduce the gospel here. He's starting to say, we're talking about a cup, and there's water, and this is super important, and I'm so glad we started in this place, but we're going to go to a spiritual thing. Verse 13, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. 
You know, Brooke prayed about addictions during the prayer segment. You know what an addiction is? It's something that we hope will satisfy us for eternity. I take part in this thing, and I hope that the first hit and, and, and the hit I'm taking today will be just as powerful, and they never are. I'm hoping that this will continue to satisfy me, and it will not destroy my life, and yet it always does. And there's so many things that, 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 do you have teenagers? Like, they'll see during the week, and it's like, ah, that's old. I want something fresh. I'm surfing Netflix, and there's just nothing new. There's something in us that always wants something fresh and always wants something new. And COVID's been brutal to us, hasn't it? Right? Jesus says, there's a water that you can drink that will satisfy you eternally. You will never grow tired of it. And you will go to that fountain and you will drink the water of God's love toward you and it will not bring any destruction into your life and you will always, always, always be satisfied by it. Could you imagine if God promised that to you today? You'd be just like her. You'd be like, give me that cup, Jesus. I'll take that. Verse 15, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. And Jesus changes the subject. Go and get your husband. Now he's getting in her business. Right? We're talking about a cup. We're talking about eternal water. It just got interesting. And now I'm going to shift it right into your personal life. The tension just came into the conversation. Can you feel it? You should. It just got real. Verse 17, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. She's got divorces and multiple marriages. Some people will come to me and, and we'll be talking about their family life and their history and they'll, they'll be like, Pastor, I've got, I've got divorces. I've got multiple marriages. Welcome to the club. You are in the right place. This church is full of broken pe people where it's okay to not be okay, but our Father in heaven loves us too much to leave us there. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're all broken. And she's living with another guy. We'll just leave it at that. Jesus confronts her lifestyle. He confronts her bondage. But before he did any of that, he drank from her cup first, didn't he? He didn't talk to her about her personal life on day one. He drank from her cup first. Some of us get the order a little bit mixed up. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans Claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. You Jews, you people. So, okay, we start with the cup and then it became spiritual and the good news, right? And then Jesus turned it into her personal life and she's like, I'm uncomfortable with the personal life conversation. Let's go to a theological controversy. You ever find yourselves digging into theological controversies in the church just so that no one will ask you about your personal life? Yeah, me either. I never do that, <laughs> ever. This is where it also starts to become about race again. She turns it not just into a theological controversy, but into a race controversy. And Jesus is going to allow this to be a consultation. Verse 21, Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one that you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes from the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. There's just a whole lot happening there. Part of what had happened to the Samaritans is because there was such hostility between them and the Jews, they broke off from them religiously. 
And the Samaritans did not go and travel down into the south where Jerusalem was and Mount Zion, which is where the temple was. They made their own temple in Mount Gerizim. And that was easier and more comfortable. Do you see the segregated worship of God's people? This is a very old idea. And she's saying, Jesus, my people worship over here. Your people worship over there. Which one's right? And oh, by the way, Jesus, my dad taught me to worship here. And his dad told him. And his grandfather told him. I was raised this way, Jesus. Why don't you come in and tell us which one of us was raised right? Whoo! That's tension. And I love our Lord. I love what he does. He hits her with two steps. First off, he says, it's actually the Jews that were right. At least on this point. He speaks the truth to her. Our God does not candy coat stuff, brothers and sisters. He tells us the truth. And what he's telling her here is, your mom and dad were wrong. And your grandpa was wrong. And his grandpa was wrong. And that applies to us how? Because some of us were raised in a certain way with God's truth and how to worship him, and, the, and the to- especially, especially the topic of race. So much of what we've brought here today into this conversation was what was handed to us by our parents, amen? And part of what complicates it and makes this whole thing so painful is that, pastor, if you show me something in God's word that conflicts with what my grandpa pa, to- told me, And I love my grandpa. If I agree with God, do I have to hate my grandfather? No. But the third option says God gets your ultimate loyalty. Even over family. Even over the way that you were raised. And we got to let some stuff go. And we got to know that we can still love our families. And we can let some stuff that they taught us just be wrong. And Jesus deals with that with her. He says, listen, this was wrong. But he gets to the better news. And the better news is God's plan all along was it wasn't Mount Gerizim and it wasn't Mount Zion in Jerusalem. What God ultimately wanted was all people in spirit and in truth worshiping wherever they are. And and, and now he builds a bridge to her. And I love that he does that. Verse 26, then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. He just comes out with it. The woman left her water jar beside the well and she ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? She has converted to Jesus here. She has accepted his gospel of love and forgiveness into her life. The living water has just come to her and it's come so powerfully that she runs back to her village and she's got to tell everybody her story. You ever been in the honeymoon phase with your faith? You ever find Jesus and you get so radically saved, you got to tell everybody and you become the most annoying Christian on your block. Amen? That's her. Like she is so pumped. She runs back into the village where all the Samaritans are. And she's got to tell everybody about Jesus. And then look at verse 30. So the people came streaming from the village. Not streaming, not you guys. They came streaming, they came walking in droves out of the village. This was not just a trickle is what it's trying to tell us. This is the whole village came out to see this thing that this woman is talking about. Jesus leads a spiritual revival by reaching out across racial lines to one woman. An individual. How would we have done this? right? Like we would have rented an arena if we're like, we have to solve this problem between Jews and and, and Samaritans and and we got to get these people saved. We got to plant a seed. Now I'm Jesus Christ. I'm only here for three years for heaven's sake. How am I going to get this done? And I got a schedule to keep and let's go. So let's rent an arena. I'm going to get a monster sound system, right? It's going to be awesome. And we're going to have all the Jews come on one side and all the Samaritans on the other side. And I'm going to give them a talking to. They better hug it out in the center, right? That's how we would have done it. 
or get a politician involved because that always works. <laughs> and let's create some new systems and let's create some new programs and let's do it that way. There's a lot of ways to go about this. How did Jesus, ask yourself, how did your Lord actually do this? He narrowed it all down to one person and he had a conversation and he drank from her cup. He said, I've got a divine appointment and it's in Samaria and I want to reach Samaria, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it by crossing racial lines and drinking from the cup of one person and I'm going to get to know her story and I'm going to show love to her and it's going to be real. It's not going to be group, it's going to be real. It's not going to be fast. It's not going to be headlines. It's not going to be running at 90 mile an hour with their hair on fire. It's going to slow down and I'm just going to sit here at this well and I'm going to talk to her as if she's worth something. That's what Jesus does. When he crosses racial lines, he does it in the right way. He does it God's way. So many of us want a racial solution in our country that is way up here with the groups. Maybe it's individual. Maybe it's just you and somebody else. And maybe you're going to have to slow down. And maybe you're going to have to get to know somebody. And maybe heart change is going to come like that. And maybe if I could just be an evangelist here for just a second, maybe after, after your conversation with this one individual, maybe God's got thousands behind them that are going to come streaming. And you don't know. And maybe it's their kids, and maybe it's generations. And I don't know, but that's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a harvest of souls that's multiracial right here in Lawton, Oklahoma. Amen. Let's set our sights on something bigger, guys. Some of our sights for this series, they've been set on, oh, maybe we need to believe some different things about race. No, maybe God wants to reach a harvest multiracially in this, in this country. And there's people that haven't found Jesus because this is the thing in the way. Do you know there's things in the way? Do you know there's people that needed a meal before they could hear the gospel of Jesus and so he fed them? Do you know there's people who were broken physically and so he healed them before he ever shared the gospel with them? And what's broken about this woman? The separation and the segregation. And so Jesus comes and drinks from her cup first. And then she gets the gospel. And then it works because this is God's way. Well, you're quiet now. On September 11th, 2001, I know right where I was standing when the planes crashed into the World Trade Center. Do you remember? Do you remember where you were? I was at Athena. It was a company. I was on the tech technology floor in Peoria, Illinois, and I was one of maybe a hundred cubicles that day, and I remember seeing it happen, and it's coming across on the internet, and, and, and I'm seeing it, and at first I don't believe it, and then it's finally confirmed, and then you realize it's real, and you kind of pop up in your cubicle, and you see like prairie dogs, all the other people popped up too, because we're not doing any more work today, because our country just got turned upside down. And now we feel attacked and now we feel afraid and now we feel enraged and now we feel vulnerable. Nobody's ever attacked us. Did you feel all that? Some of you felt all that. Some of you know where you were. And I remember the brave police officers who rushed into those buildings to save people at risk to their own lives. And some of them did not keep their lives that day. And, and, the, and the firemen, the first responders... You saw all these brave people doing these brave things. It was inspiring. It was amazing. I saw Americans sign up for the military because they wanted to serve their country and they wanted to protect what hadn't been protected before. Do you feel that? I felt that. I felt all that stuff and I admired all that stuff and I honor all that stuff and the churches were full. The churches were full. Everybody was coming to pray. Everybody was coming to seek God. For weeks, the churches were full. You couldn't get a seat. That was September 11th. Four days after the attack, September 15th, there was an American named Frank Roque, Frank Silva Roque. And he was driving by a Chevron gas station in Mesa, Arizona. And I'll just give you a little detail. We dropped off my son at college two weeks ago, and we dropped him off in Mesa, Arizona. And I had no idea this event took place there. 
But Frank Roke was driving along and he came past that gas station and he found Balbir Singh Sodi. Chevron gas station. And Balbir was out planting flowers. And Balbir had come to this country and worked for Hewlett Packard as a, as a technology for a person for about 10 years and worked himself up in the organization and made enough money because his dream was to own some franchises because he wanted to be independent and he wanted to be more wealthy and run his own stuff. And, and so he had gotten his first um, uh, gas station and he, he had left Hewlett Packard and, and he was there and he was planting flowers with his landscaping guy. And Frank drives up, rolls down his window, pulls out a handgun and shoots him five times till he's dead. Frank is serving life in prison for murder. Now, I'm not going where you think I'm going right now with this. What Frank did was detestable and wrong. Can we agree to that? It's so detestable, it's so wrong that, that we can't even relate to what Frank did. Uh, the family of Balbir Singh Sodi grieved for him. The community, especially his Sikh community, grieved for him. Frank thought he was a, a member of Al-Qaeda, of this Arab militant Muslim group. He wasn't, he was a Sikh completely different religious sect. He wasn't from Afghanistan. He was from India. Balbir would not have seen himself in any way connected with anything that had gone on. He was horrified with the September 11th attacks, if you read about it, and I've read about it. But sometimes what we do is, in the midst of our culture, we keep things at this really generic level with really broad categories. And we're moving so fast, aren't we? That we only listen to what the commentators say. And we don't read the articles, we just read the headlines. And we don't look at the nuances that even though some of these people might look a bit similar to us, they're actually very vastly different. And the only way to actually figure out the nuances is to get to know them. And Frank was given life in prison and... and Balbir's community grieved for him. His niece even wrote him this beautiful poem to honor him, and I read it this last week. And you just could see the, the, the love that she had for her uncle. What Frank did was terrible. And this, this thing that took place, this tragedy that took place, it was not an isolated case. See, this attack, it was one of hundreds of attacks that took place after 9-11. Americans going after people that looked Arab to them. And not all of them were murder. Not all of them ended in death. Some of them were physical attacks. Some of them were, were, were messages and threats that were sent. Some of them were ugly interactions between people. Here's the thing, though. There's a part of me, and this is super risky. This is the riskiest moment of this morning. There's a part of me that can empathize with Frank. I can't empathize with murder. I'm not saying that. But I can empathize with the fear. I can empathize with the rage. Because I felt it at the time. I can empathize with the feeling of total vulnerability I can empathize with that stuff. And some of you are like, I can't empathize with this. Can you empathize with any of those attacks? Can you empathize with any of those actions? Can you get past the surface of the action that was taken and say, I can feel some of the emotions that this person felt? Why? Because this whole thing's got nuances to it. And part of the reason... Some of us in the room can feel a certain amount of empathy for some of those people is because they're in our in-group. We're also an American. 
who saw that happen, and we felt all of those things. And so empathy and connection make a little bit more sense because they're in our in-group and we get it. So last few months, we've had Black Lives Matter protests. And in the midst of those protests, sometimes there were looters and there was looting. And people destroyed property and people burned things down. And why? And I'm not saying it was all black and white. Because if you watched the coverage and if you dove into the nuance just a little bit, you saw that there were all kinds of weird situations that was going on in the midst of that. But it was oversimplified to us in the media as a black and white thing. And we were called to take sides. And we were called to those looters, right? Now, it was wrong. Can we agree it was wrong? To destroy another person's property because you're angry and afraid is wrong. It's wrong. We need to say that. Can we grieve for those people that were affected and lost livelihoods in some cases? as a result of that looting, can we? Yes. But in a multiracial church, there are different levels of empathy all across this room for those folks that did that. And some of you are like, I can't empathize with that at all. And some of you are like, when George Floyd was killed, there was a part of me and emotions got stirred up. And I'm not saying that I would ever do that thing, but I can emotionally connect to how a person got there. And some of you can't, and I get that. But do you realize how complicated this is? I know it's a quiet room right now. I know I'm stepping on all kinds of things. It is complicated. There's a reason that Jesus did not go to Samaria and rent an arena because there's nuances. And some of this stuff, if we're actually gonna carry the message of Christ, it's not so much to groups, it's to individuals where we can slow it down and we can sit down with someone and we can come to understand that person. That's what I'm advocating for here. 24-7 news, they are not motivated to give you nuance. They are not good shepherds of your soul. I'm sorry, they're not. They're, mod- they're, they're, they're motivated toward ads. And, and if you, with a clickbait, if you go and jump into their thing and they've oversimplified a very, very complicated issue and they get your click, they get money. And that's just real. And we let them feed our souls. Do not let someone who is motivated to oversimplify human hearts, do not let them feed your soul. Lean into the nuance. Realize people are individual. Get to know them and let that change you. Drink from their cup. It's the book of James. He says this. He says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James says you gotta slow down. I don't have time to do all that research. Take the time. If you wanna have an opinion and you wanna share that opinion at parties, why don't you take the time? Why don't you slow down? Why don't you embrace the fact that there's complexity and love people? Somebody say amen and love people. I know I've messed with you today. Love people. This is the model. Why did we read about the woman at the well? Because Jesus modeled an individual interaction with us that crossed racial lines, and he did it a particular way, and he got to know this woman and her particular story. And as a result, people streamed out of her village toward him. Don't you want that? Amen? Amen. So if you would, there's a sheet on your chairs right now. Take that out, and I want you to wave that at me. And for you folks online, they are posting a PDF of this insert on your, in your chat right now, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, it's, it's, it's going to be there. Are you waving? Are you waving? I can see you. Okay, great, great. 
All right, so I asked myself this question this week. Are we simply going to preach on racism for four weeks and then change the subject? No, we're not. In one ear and out the other. Isn't that the saying? And it can be like that if we don't take action and we don't obey the Lord. Things that we learn, things that God tells us, we have to convert his truth into action and obedience in our lives or we don't tend to change. That's the way we are as a group of people. And so that's what that sheet of paper is right there. There's three steps that I want you to take. And I'm for real about this, folks. I want us to do this. I'm your pastor and I'm telling you. If I've got any authority in your life, I want you to do this. Really. Three steps. Number one, I want you to schedule a teachable moment. Schedule it. Put it on your schedule. A date, a time. And I want you to schedule a teachable moment with someone that's in your out group, somebody not like you. Do you remember the, the picture that we had last week and you're scanning the faces? You're scanning the portraits? And you start scanning them and you're like, there's nobody in my out group. There's no, nobody I feel uncomfortable with. And then I said, maybe there's 20 people just like this one picture is in a room and you walk into the room and suddenly you're uncomfortable. And that's when some of us got it. I talked to a family last week and they got it at that point. And, and she was telling me last week, she's like, I'm sitting there scanning through the faces and I found an old white guy. And she's like, I realized that that was it. And then we kept talking for about five minutes. And at the end of the conversation, they asked me if, they, if I would come over to their house for dinner. And I realized I'm the old white guy. <laughs> <sighs> so who is it? Reach out to them. Coffee. Let's have a soda. Because we call it soda, not pop, right? Maybe you go for the deluxe model and it's dinner at my house. Ooh, now you're eating on my china, right? You're using my bathroom, drinking from my cup. Are you getting it, right? It all of a sudden starts to become real. It's a whole other thing. Schedule your moment. And then when you get together, you can talk about, you know, you can talk about sports, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about the whole time. But at one point in that discussion, what I want you to do is ask a teachable question. And I've given you one to take a look at right there. What don't I know about you and your experience? You're sitting here staring at me across the table. You, you're pretty sure there's a whole lot that I don't know. Just tell me one thing. I don't get it. So educate me. And then flip the conversation. It's not one-sided, it's two-sided. And then the other person asks the question. And you both learn. It's not a race confrontation, it's a race consultation because we're teachable. And then the third thing is send us a short testimony of what you learned. This is the thing I didn't know. To gracelawton.org, send it to that email and I will read it. Okay, why are we sending this in? Do you want a picture? No, I don't want your pictures. It's not a social, social media blitz. I want testimonies of what God has done and what God has taught you. And I'm praying for 20 of these to come in by mid-September. It's real. I want to see 20 of these by mid-September. Could you imagine if 20 of God's people had a teachable moment like this with somebody in their out group? It's not just a sermon series. And we talked about it for four weeks and changed the subject. We did something. And I don't want just 20. Secretly, I want 50. And, and really, I want 100. Do you want 100? Yeah. Like, do this. Take it seriously. See what God does. Amen. Would you guys stand? Do not merely listen to the word, but do what it says. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so good. God, we worship you, Lord. There's just, there's a way about you, Jesus, that every single time you did a thing, you did it right. You did it perfect. And Lord, it frees us up. We can read your word. We can watch how you did it. We can learn. And God, we see some things that we never saw before today. Jesus, thank you. 
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you drank from her cup before you ever talked to her about God. Thank you, Jesus. Give us that courage, Lord. Would you slow us down, Jesus? God, would you, would you make us frustrated with headlines? Would you make us frustrated with oversimplification of very complex people? Lord, would you give us hearts that consider your people worth the time? Show us how to love. And God, I pray for a harvest. I pray for a harvest of people that would come streaming out of the village to find Jesus because we stepped out obediently. God, let it be done right here in Lawton, Oklahoma. In Christ's name, amen. Grace, we remind you that uh, if you need prayer for whatever reason, our prayer teams are located in the back of the sanctuary and all around the, the back area there. And if you need prayer, if you have something on your heart or maybe prayer for somebody else, please go and see them. And they're eagerly waiting to, to pray with you. If you guys, uh, we're just going to worship one last time. When I thought I lost me, you know where I left me, you Picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You are the defense.